They've held it and they've shaped it. Now the world's greatest players tell the full story of the Rugby World Cup. In the past 20 years, the Rugby World Cup has become one of the greatest events in sport. It's the ultimate. When you talk rugby, the World Cup is it. We speak to every major figure in the tournament's history. I was always going to score and I think that's an attitude everyone should have. We relive the defining moments as the players experience them. Charging through is Gordon Hamilton. Has he got the pace to get there, the big flanker? Yes! The reserves up in the grandstand, Nick Farr Jones up in the grandstand. I think the tears were flying when the Irish scored the try. It looked like it was a World Cup disaster. I never knew he was going to be there, and I never ever thought in my life that he would wear a Springbok jumper. I kept on looking at my watch. When will the referee blow the, uh, the whistle? I was so sensitive. You get accused of not trying or not wanting it enough or not being good enough. Um, listen, what a load of bollocks that is. Now, the first thing is we practice up over the years, for about three or four years, every now and then. We were terrible at it in practice, to be honest. We were terrible. You know, it's almost like a destiny thing. I think when you get to that level, you give it your best shot, but you almost feel like eerily before you go out there, the game's been decided somehow. It all began very far from the pitch, in the committee rooms of Australian and New Zealand rugby. In 1985, Dick Littlejohn and Australian counterpart Nick Shahady led their two unions' efforts to get a World Cup accepted by the International Games governing body. We could see the game turning professional, eventually, and we were concerned that an entrepreneur could take over, buy players, put on a, a rugby circus, if you like, and, the, and rugby would lose control of the game. And that's the last thing we wanted. We, we thought that a Rugby World Cup would bind rugby together. When the pair flew to the UK to present their idea to the Northern Hemisphere boards, they faced both opposition and indifference. We met in Los Angeles on the way over, and we'd agreed to take our national uniforms to meet the welcoming committee at Heathrow. So just out of Heathrow, we, we put on a clean shirt, shaved, tidied ourselves up, got off the aeroplane, marched down to the reception area, and there was no one there. I think that's when we realised that we had a bit of a problem. We were treated as a joke, and we were in lots of places. The feeling was it may well affect and interfere with particularly the Five Nations, uh, and uh, therefore um, European countries were not 100% sure about, about it. So uh, there was a great deal of talk, argument and discussion before it was finally accepted. Despite strong opposition from several home nations, the international board gave its approval to the concept at a momentous meeting in Paris in 1985. The international board voted to organise, on an experimental basis, two World Cups. One in 1987 in the Southern Hemisphere, one in 1991 in the Northern Hemisphere, and then to decide whether or not the World Cup would continue. Australia and New Zealand shared the tournament in 1987. With South Africa still in international isolation, the co-hosts were widely expected to contest the final. But all 16 teams invited to take part were to some extent heading into the unknown. It was a great day, that first kickoff. I remember looking at Dick and he looked at me and it was a great sigh of relief. It all began. 
And we're in a long row, and, and, and right at the moment as the ball was being kicked off, Nick leant forward and I leant forward, and we looked along the row, saw each other, and gave each other the thumbs up. And the tournament began in style. The first match was between New Zealand and Italy. It produced one of the great moments in the history of the Rugby World Cup. I was always going to score and I think that's an attitude everyone should have. You know, and then if I didn't score, well at least I had a go. Um, but that day it just went well. But I'd done that 20 times that year and not scored. But unless you take off with the intention of getting where you want to go, you'll never get there. I think that was important because it was iconic. It was iconic of the type of rugby we wanted to play. And when you see things on television after the match and you see that wonderful try, you think, hey, that's us, that's the way we play. The whole sense of no boundaries and, and just enjoy it and run with the ball and, and we could be this extraordinary team, I think was summed up by that try because it was such an extraordinary try. New Zealand went on to rout the Italians. It was an ominous statement of intent. After the first game, there was, there was only going to be one winner. I think the difference in standard between New Zealand and every other side in the world at that time was, uh, was substantial. After coasting through the first round, New Zealand faced their first real test against Scotland in the quarter-finals. So that was the first of the knockout phase and we had huge respect for Scotland and we weren't ready to go home. And yet, you know, once you enter that stage, you have a bad day at the office, you can go home. Um, that was a big day, a lot of nervous guys that day, it was a big build-up. Patrick throws, again, Michael Jones burst away. But on there to Gary Wentz, Gary Wentz never scored in an international, that's Fitzpatrick the hooker. Nervous they may have been, but the All Blacks stretched away after a tight first half for a big victory over the Scots. Kirk Phillips bumps all the way along the line to Stanley. This is the full-back Gallagher. That's the try that seals the match for New Zealand. Australia were almost as comfortable in their victory over Ireland to book a semi-final with France, winners over Fiji in the last eight. The last quarter-final was a low-quality match between England and Wales. Play goes on, seven, and the Sims to Webb. Harrison losing it forward, though, he's having his shocker. If you think back to that awful quarter-final between England and Wales, which was the worst match of the tournament, um, it showcased Home Nations rugby for all the wrong reasons. I think then you compared that to the semi-final that France and Australia played, and you realised there were sort of, if you like, three teams who are starting to move into a new era of rugby, New Zealand, France and Australia, and the home nations just had to do something. They had to start playing. Wales went through to play the All Blacks. But before that match, Australia would host France in the first semi-final at Concord Oval in Sydney. It's amazing when you look back at it now and you, you look how popular Rugby World Cup is and how difficult it is and expensive to get a ticket to a major game. I mean, I think it that much unloved Concord Oval where that game was played, I think the capacity was about 22,000, and I think there was about 4,000 empty seats, which, which gives you an indication of how the game has grown over the last two decades. The fans who did buy a ticket were in for a treat. The match against Australia was just incredible. Certainly one of the best matches I've ever played with the French team. Every ten years or so, there's a game like that one. After Seller glided over to give France the advantage, Australia immediately struck back, with David Campisi breaking the world try-scoring record for the hosts. The team still couldn't be separated after 80 minutes, and the match went to extra time. Then the try at the end was just mad. The ball came out to me, and I kicked upfield. 
Then Laurier turns up, this big second rower, giving support in extra time. I don't know where he came from. He plows into Campisi. We win the ball back, and play goes right. Then Berbizier passes to me, and I'm all alone, surrounded by Wallabies. I just throw the ball out, and Rodriguez picks it up and finds Serge Blanco in full flight, who scores in the corner. I actually remember the situation and, uh, you know, I mean, you look back and say what we should have done and what should have happened. You know, Serge Blanco was a great player, great finisher. I mean, and that's, he was in the right place at the right time and, and that uh, basically sealed it for the French. It was about much more than just that try. It was really about a whole system of play, a whole approach to the game that was repaid on that particular day by that try. And it wasn't just Serge Blanco's score, it was a try for the whole French team. At the end of the day, they probably, um, they saved us from the embarrassment of getting smashed by the All Blacks at Eden Park because um, what the All Blacks did in 87, um, they put daylight between themselves and the rest of the world rugby and, uh, you know, they went on to beat us by about 15 points in the one-off Bledisloe that, uh, later that year. Um, we wouldn't have won the final, so, um, you know, it's great that they got to that final. The second semi-final in Brisbane the next day was decided much more quickly. It all took was 10 minutes and we were so precise, we were so fast, the set pieces were going so well and we just played with, with you know, with that sort of joie de vivre of um, it's a semi-final of the World Cup but we knew we were going to win and we were playing great rugby and, uh, and we just wanted to stay out there as long as possible so we could play rugby. The All Blacks were heading home to Auckland for the final. It was the first time that the people of New Zealand had come together and really supported us uh, as a nation and when we my lingering moment will be when we went to go out to get on the bus to go to the game. There was probably somewhere like five or six hundred, maybe even more people, just cheering the guys onto the bus. And I knew then that uh, it was going to take a hell of an effort from France to beat us. At Eden Park, the French team gathered together during their national anthem, seeking another inspired performance. You know, I think the important thing that day was maybe not winning, but for us to tell each other that we loved each other and that the whole adventure at that World Cup had brought us closer together and we would remain that close until the end of our days. Some of the team were crying. It was perhaps too emotional, but it was a beautiful moment and we'll never forget it. Following a tight first half, New Zealand seized control shortly after the break. Jones came up the line there to make the jump. Now that's unusual. Taylor now. Stanley again. He's done it for fun for the crash ball all day. Kirk. Fox. Jones. Kirk. The moment that I went over the line, I knew in my bones that we were the World Cup champions. I just knew we were going to win. And, and I was, I'm pleased that, that that feeling came during the course of the game. So I remember banging my fist on the ground thinking, unbelievable, we're the world champions. Kirk had an inspired day, leading his team from the front as John Cohen put the result beyond doubt. sword in the people, the, 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 the joy that it gave the people, uh, not so much the, the rugby team because we were pretty tired afterwards, but the joy that the people got from us winning it, you know, it just made you feel good about yourself, that you'd done something for other people as well. We were standing on the top of Everest and looked around and 
The first thing you do after that is turn around and take a step down off the mountain. That thing that you've thought about since you were a, a little boy, it's over. The first Rugby World Cup had been dominated by a team that would prove itself to be one of the great international sides of all time. It was such a talented team, uh, and it just emerged at the start of the World Cup. And of course it went on for three years and, and didn't lose a match, so uh, it did prove to be one of the greatest all-black teams of all time, but it emerged uh, at the beginning of the World Cup. In 1991, Kiwi hands still held a firm grip on the Webb Ellis Cup as the Northern Hemisphere took its turn to host the tournament. The opening match was at Twickenham, as England faced the defending champions. The 1987 tournament had been the nadir for English rugby. Now they were resurgent under Jeff Cook's management and dynamic young captain Will Carling. But they were not yet ready to match the All Blacks. If you sat England players down really brutally honestly and said before that game, New Zealand, you know, do you think we are yet at a stage where, you know, will we beat these guys consistently? I don't think we were. And it was one of those classic moments when you sat in the changing room afterwards. That was the first time I played New Zealand. And it's afterwards you think, you know, we could have beaten them. We should have beaten them. If that match showed the top teams were more competitive than ever, three days later in Cardiff, Wales found out that no side at the tournament could be underestimated. As a past player, you always get asked, what is your highlight? And to this day, it still is that day because of what it did for Samoan Rugby, Pacific Island Rugby. Um, so it really opened the way for, for Pacific Island Rugby, and it really stored a huge amount of pride in the game and a lot of interest in the game. The defeat meant co-hosts Wales would not make the knockout stages. Australia topped their group to book a quarter-final at Lansdowne Road against Ireland. The Irish people have this ability to lull you into a false sense of security. Everywhere you go, round every corner, was the Irish handshake would come out, the glass of Guinness. You know, there it is. And, and they'd be saying, well, make sure you go easy on our boys this weekend. You know, don't beat them by too much. And then, of course, you get out on the pitch and it's like warfare. You know, you're getting hit from left, right, centre. They're scragging you in the line out, dragging you down, pushing you, you know, out of the way and different things. And it was a really tough game. It was really boiling up already. Such passion generated by this game, and my word, referee having trouble in cooling these two sides down. Australia were undermined by an injury to Nick Farr Jones, which forced their captain off the pitch just after David Campisi scored the opening try. Michael Liner took over the leadership, and the Wallabies still seemed too strong for Ireland. The Irish did not look like scoring. Right through the whole game. You know, so but that's that's the Irish. They always do something that you don't expect. And I remember when they kicked the ball through, and I was stupid because I was trying to, to get my wing away from the ball instead of concentrating the ball. And what happened was, obviously, picked it up, Hamilton scored in the corner. Has he got the pace to get there to Yes! As a kid growing up, you watch famous tries being scored. And, and the nicest thing in those days when crowd control wasn't what it is now, the crowd came onto the pitch, and uh, it was whenever they came on and... Um, uh, and threw their arms around me, it, it, it suddenly dawned on me that this was something quite, quite important for, for the time that it lasted. Ireland were three points ahead, just three minutes from a historic victory. The reserves up in the grandstand, Nick Farr Jones up in the grandstand, I think the tears were flying when the Irish scored the try. It looked like it was a World Cup disaster. We seem to be in for a major shot. Ireland leading Australia, 18 points to 15. Had I been out there at the time and they scored that try, I would have read the right act to the guys. <laughs> um, I would have probably kicked short to secure the possession. When that final scrum came, I'm pretty sure I would have said to Michael, get in the slot, mate. We're going for drop goal. Let's try and even this game up, take it to extra time. Uh, Michael did it all differently. <laughs> um, thank God he was out there. <laughs> As he scored, I just thought he hadn't scored the try because the Lansdowne Road was just, it was just eerie silence. The only people you could hear were the commentators in the grandstand commentating on the ground because the whole ground was just deathly quiet. And is there time for play to continue? Almost a minute and a half of injury time at the end of this game. No, that's it. Australia through then by the skin of their teeth. 
But when we went through, I, I, it was that emotional. I, I, I sort of ended up in tears. And I mean, I think I decided then and there that I could never be a coach. The emotions were even raw in Paris. Their opening defeat to New Zealand meant England had to take on bitter rivals. France at Parc de Prince in their quarter final. Bizarrely, it's one of my favourite games. And there's obviously something wrong with me because I think the, the best games I've ever played in are the, the most brutal because I think that, that's what it's all about. You know, that's when you find out what's going on. You know, that's when you find out about your teammates, when you find out about yourself. And it was a full on game. Early on, England's tactics were clear. That's what they're looking for. Rob Andrew putting it high again. Target the talisman who was Blanco at the back and most of the England pack would arrive at the same time as the ball. One or two of them would arrive a bit late and, and just, you know, he, he always got a little bit of extra treatment because he was one of the star men and it was a way of getting under the skin of, of the French team. From the resulting penalty, Nigel Heslop hit Blanco with a late tackle after another high kick. Heslop plays it back into the 22. Blanco marks it. Heslop hits him and is immediately floored. That day, we fell into a trap. A trap that was, of course, totally normal because it's part of rugby. And it was one that our English friends set for us. Maybe we didn't know how to control ourselves, but it's true that that day we felt it unjust. And Blanco's shaking. He's actually shaking. This is only two minutes into a game. And I was sort of looking at him, it's just like, you know, and I looked at the French and, and they were all, you know, absolutely. Um, right on the edge, and, and I remember going back to, to the guys and uh, saying, listen, geez, uh, these boys are right on the edge. And before I could finish anything, Wade said, does that mean we can keep kicking them? And uh, <laughs> I was like, yeah, yeah, just don't, don't get seen. England went on to win. Mickey Skinner's tackle on Marc Session epitomised their defiance that day. For France, it was a sad way to bid farewell to Blanco in what was his final test match. But that's part of the charm of rugby, and that's why we respect everything that happened, even though we lost. Still, we know that somewhere, somehow, along with our English friends, we're writing another page of world rugby history. Carling completed the victory on the final whistle. But ahead for England came another daunting trip. Scotland had easily beaten Samoa in their quarter-final, and Murrayfield would host the semi where England had lost out on a Grand Slam the previous year. I think we were, you know, pretty close to being unbeatable at, at home. Um, and, you know, we enjoyed playing at, at Murrayfield. We had a fantastic reception and rapport with the crowd. And uh, there were a lot of the guys that were very well known to the Scottish rugby public and, and indeed beyond. It wasn't exactly um, a rugby game. It was just a, a war of attrition. Who could hold the nerve? the most and um, you know very uh, not pretty uh, in fact you know very very basic a drab match is remembered for one incident in particular Gavin Hastings had been the best player on the pitch and with the scores tied at six all late on had a straightforward kick to put Scotland ahead and he's missed it would you believe it above any other point in my career if I could change one thing it would be to get that kick going six inches to the left of the post and miss rather than six inches to the right. It was a big lift to us that that was missed at that point although it was only six all it would have only made it nine six it was a psychologically big lift you know to go back down get away from that end of the field and have another opportunity. Andrew took the chance and unadventurous, dour England were through. While England celebrated, one of their potential opponents in the final was watching, and typically unimpressed. And it was in the England dressing room, and Will Carley had the ball and said, today, it was Rory Underwood's 50th test, here's the match ball. And I said to the guys, it's the first time he's touched it today. <laughs> well, you had a bit of a laugh. And then to the second right semi was between Campisi's Australia throws, and New Zealand. Heels, Far Jones, Liner. Liner steps inside, swallowed by the All Blacks. 
by Jones. Campisi, David Campisi, David Campisi all the way. The first 20 minutes of that game was probably the best rugby that we've played in probably a 10 year period. Um, everything worked for us. We were, we were playing a really up tempo game and, and the All Blacks were on the back foot straight away. Um, and that's something we hadn't seen for a while. After Campisi's superb early score, Australia's talisman was soon up to his old tricks again. Far Jones digs it out. Liner, little chip ahead. Horan's going to chase that, so's Campisi. I stepped one way, stepped the other. I could hear Tim Horan. And I could just see him. So, to me, the only pass was that. And it worked. Um, and, you know, I think um, it was one of those things that happened. And you've got to try things. If you don't try, you never know. The Wallabies were through to the final. It looked likely to be an intriguing clash of styles, but incredibly, England decided to abandon the tight game plan that had served them so well up to that point. Perhaps Campisi's incessant criticism had hit home. And I think Campo's jibes did get at us, and I just don't think we had enough experience and enough tough mental toughness to actually just blank it all out and say, look, it's a World Cup final, it's in our backyard, we're just going to win it. If we win it 9-6 again, like the semi-final, who's going to care? All of the other nations wanted us to beat England. Uh, the Irish, the Scottish, the Welsh, you know, the French, they were all were sending us you know, faxes and saying, you know, good luck and we're with you, we're supporting you. And I thought, gee, this is something special for them as well. England attacked from the start at Twickenham, but small errors littered their game and the Wallabies took advantage. The referee allowed him to go, he said that was off the foot. Underwood there, Horan having to jump for it. And he's away, Horan down the wing. The cover's across. It's still dangerous though with Webb going back. And play there going right from deep in 122 to the other. They had one chance, peel the line out, bang, they scored. You know, it was clinical, it was done very well, very fast. Um, it caught us unaware, and that was, you know, that's the difference. In, in a sense, that is the difference. We had a lot of chances. We weren't clinical with any of ours. We weren't precise enough. Um, hence, we didn't win. And that day, we got one lousy try we, from a five-meter, you know, line out and a rolling ball. So, I mean, if there's any regrets, it's, it's that we didn't win the game in style. But it was a fantastic effort defensively. Um, you know, just the, the, the determination and um, the commitment in, in defence and some of the tackles that were pulled off, that was something I feel very proud of. David Campisi stopped one try in controversial fashion, but the Wallabies were deserved winners of their first world title. The thing is, it's great to win, but when you sit down afterwards and say, you know, it took a lot of hard work, you know, all that sacrifice you've done to be where you are, and now you're here. Now you start to say, well, where can we go from here? There's only one way you go, that's down. Nick Farr-Jones, the Australian captain. The moment he has been working and waiting for. I remember being in the bars when uh, the, the then British Prime Minister came in in his suit and the boys started to take a few photographs. They found it quite amusing. There I am, stark naked, and here's, here's the, the British Prime Minister. And, um, you know, thank God we didn't have internet and email in those days because uh, the, the photos would have gone around the world and my only excuse would have been it was bloody cold that November afternoon. <laughs> Even more of a shock for Far Jones was the homecoming party in Sydney. There were 130,000 people that turned up. I mean, it, it's those sort of times that you actually realise that what you did on the other side of the world was special to a lot of people. So it's, it's when you see that and when you see that you know, junior registration in rugby is up 300% the next year. That, that's when you realise you've, you've left a, a legacy. And, um, and, and those things, you know, were very, very special, um, you know, when we got back and uh, when we realised that, you know, a lot of people had been impacted by what we did. Next up, South Africa, 1995. That day, it changed the picture altogether. United our people. South Africa opens its arms and its heart to embrace you all. 
It is my privilege to declare this the 1995 Rugby World Cup tournament open. The 1995 World Cup would have a far greater impact than the two previous tournaments, reaching out to a global audience from a country that had long been in sporting isolation. Rugby had been essentially a white sport in apartheid South Africa, but Nelson Mandela's backing ensured the whole nation embraced the opportunity to host the tournament. Cape Town was the venue for the first match, and one of the most significant. South Africa celebrated their World Cup debut with victory over the defending champion Wallabies. It was the toughest draw. Undefeated Australia came to the World Cup and they had such an unbelievable team. I think in hindsight, it was the best possible draw for us because when we got over that hurdle, the whole team started believing and everybody started, and the country started saying, hang on a minute, these guys might just do this thing. South Africa were not alone in getting quickly off the starting blocks. New Zealand's first match was against Ireland, and it saw the All Blacks unleash a virtually unknown 20-year-old in the world in John Alomu. Say the name Alomu, because you'll be saying it a lot more over the next few years. South Africa's serene progress was upset by their final group match, a brutal clash with Canada. Good bear on the tackle, and that was uh, Winston Stanley. Well, that's unnecessary, one feels, from Winston Stanley initially. James Dalton was sent off for his part in the brawl, along with two Canadians, while Springbok winger Peter Hendricks was also suspended. Because the referee is sending off James Dalton, Gareth Reese and Rod Snow. Losing these two guys, to me as, as a captain, I was furious. And I took a while to get over that. But Chester helped us. The ban for Peter Hendricks allowed Chester Williams, who was returning from injury, straight back into the Springbok team. As the only non-white in the squad, he faced intense public attention. Thank you. What is this for? Yeah. You know, when he arrived, he explained to us what's happening in this country, what's happening in the streets of South Africa. And I asked him to tell the team, you know, what a wonderful uh, opportunity we have. And we turned that negative into a positive. They made me so welcome uh, being part of the squad again. And I think that's why uh, we played so well as, as, uh, during that year in the, in the World Cup. You know, we were all, we were friends, we were family that year. And it was just a great year for us as South Africans. Chester was the face of South Africa leading up to the World Cup. There was a lot of pressure on him as an individual. You know, he was, uh, all the major sponsors used him. You know, I think that pressure on him must have been uh, tremendous. And what a way to relieve it by getting into the quarterfinals and, and actually doing the business. In the quarterfinals against Western Samoa, Williams was superb. Four tries ensured his complete acceptance by the Springbok squad and the nation. Can Williams get in? Great running by Chester Williams, hat trick for him. The pick of the quarterfinals was a rerun of the 1991 final, England against Australia. One of our great moments was Austin Swain, who was our psychologist. We sent him off to spy on the Australians, pretending he was just like an Australian backpacker, and he noted down all their strike moves. Came back and, and, and gave us the strike moves 24 hours before the, uh, before the game, which was just unbelievable. So we had the whole lot. With the scores level deep in injury time, the match was decided by Rob Andrew. Rob, you see, usually was very obedient, and I was, you know, I was in, you know it was just disgraceful. And, uh, so I said to him, just put it in the corner. And uh, I went to chase it and I saw him, you know, drop this goal. And I remember thinking, you stupid, you know, and then you watch and you think, oh, well, fair enough. He struck it well as Andrew. That's there. I never listened to him anyway, so I wasn't going to start then. I knew as soon as I'd hit it, I knew the moment that it left my boot, that it was gone. Because it was just so sweet, it just flew. And it was still going up. As it, as it went over the bar, I mean, it was, you know, it was just meant to go over. France had already beaten Ireland to book a semi-final against the hosts at King's Park. It never rains in Durban, the locals said. The day of the game, the heavens opened. 
and the referee went to the changing rooms to let both teams know if the match could go ahead. And then he said something that actually hit me like a sledgehammer. He said, then if we can't play in half an hour, you guys are out of the World Cup. I didn't know the rules of the game stated that if the game is not played for whatever reasons that evening, it's not postponed, it's cancelled, and the team with the worst disciplinary record is out of the World Cup. And after the brawl against Canada, South Africa would have been out of their own tournament if the match had been called off. But the weather relented enough for the game to go ahead. In the atrocious conditions, it was predictably tight. South Africa held a narrow lead late on, but the French went after the winning try. They played and attacked and the ball was kicked and Abdel bin Aziz grabbed the kick and we were all chasing from behind and he went for the line and I thought he scored. Yes, we really yes I did score it. It was on the line. If we had video refereeing back then, that try would have been allowed. But it's nothing important really. It's just sport. <laughs> The South African pack still had to hold out against one last French scrum. That was the most important scrum, I think, in our careers. And then they had 13 guys into the scrum. They, the French loaded the scrum, but the scrum stayed firm. And uh, we were in the final. It was just amazing. Sport isn't just about winning and losing, because destiny had decided that South Africa would win that World Cup for a very simple reason. It would help them as a nation. They had that connection between whites and blacks with Nelson Mandela in the middle. It was something extraordinary. In the second semi-final, England faced the All Blacks. Underwood can't take, this is the big man, Lobu. He's still on his feet. Lobu can score. That's a great try for New Zealand. To me, that was a, I guess that's a defining moment in my career more than anything else. Um, I keep telling everyone if, uh, if Mike Cat was about maybe one or two steps back, I would have fallen in front of him. And I was thinking, right, what do I do? Do I jump on top of him and try and pull him down with his weight, or do I do the traditional? So I thought I'll do the traditional sort of tackle, and uh, you know, he just ran through the top of me, really. You know, that set the tone in terms of that game. Um, scoring that try against England just, um, just set the tone for the All Blacks. Lomu was unstoppable. England were destroyed inside the first quarter. Then to add insult to injury, a moment of pure self-indulgence from Zinzan Brook. Is there any more famous drop goals? <laughs> um, I don't know, it was, just, it was a weird sort of scenario. I had a couple of guys screaming at me not to, not to do it. Mike Brewer was one guy who sort of nearly burst my eardrum. He was just screaming at no, don't do it. Even before half-time, the match was over. New Zealand were looking invincible and through to the final. All I remember sitting in the changing room afterwards thinking, well, there's, there's no way there's any team in the world who's going to stop that. And, and on that performance, there wouldn't have been. And I don't mean that, you know, just because we couldn't. They were, they were exceptional. Jonah Lomu was the star of an all-black team that seemed to have no weaknesses. But before the final, the squad were hit by a debilitating stomach bug. The food poisoning had a marked effect, you know, to see our, the great Colin Meads, our manager, crawling into the team room on Friday morning because he couldn't walk. Um, I think it spelt volumes in terms of, of you know, where we were at, really. The All Black squad was decimated by the food poisoning outbreak, and as kickoff approached, the Springboks also had an uncomfortable feeling in their stomachs. In the morning of the match, the guys were very nervous, um, and I tried to just calm them down, but they were just so nervous. Some of the guys were almost physically ill. On the bus, the, actually, the people, the traffic officers that were riding the motorcycles, the motor, they were so tense. I mean, these guys were pumped, <laughs> taking us to Ellis Park. Oof, the whole week was just Hollywood stuff, blockbuster stuff. And the biggest twist in the plot was yet to come. Nelson Mandela greeted the South African team in a Springbok shirt. For so long, a despised symbol of Africana culture to many black South Africans. I never knew he was going to be there, eh? and I never ever thought in my life that he would wear a Springbok jumper. 
and he just stood there and he had this aura and he just said good luck that's that's just all he said and then he turned around and there was this number six on his back and that was me just, i was so emotional i couldn't sing the anthem i was just you know, i was just too emotional too proud it is because i understood the impact of sport it was a very important sport and precisely because sports uh, speaks a language which is understood by everybody throughout the world, I supported it. Wearing the Springbok jersey was a gesture Mandela had considered carefully with trusted advisors like Bishop Desmond Tutu. He knew just how sensitive uh, emotions were around the Springbok emblem uh, on both sides. I mean, feelings were very, very strong um, on the part of those who had been excluded in the past who were saying, no, this is a symbol that we don't want uh, because it reminds us of a painful past. To hear 72,000 people start chanting Mandela, Mandela. And then there's 15 of us there, <laughs> looking, thinking, God, how are we ever going to beat these buggers? But uh, no, it was a, it was a, you know, for me, it was a, an amazing experience, uh, you know, probably a life-changing experience to be actually be involved in that environment. South African coach Kitch Christie had expected a tight match, and that was exactly what it was, with rugged Springbok defence keeping Jonah Lomu at bay. Before kickoff. Christie also suggested to fly half Joel Stransky that the drop goal might prove a potent weapon. What he did is he planted the seed, and we had a bit of a chat about it, and he said, you know, it's a, if you're good at it, he said, it's the easiest form of points in the game. And he obviously referred to Nas Puerto, who was probably the best drop kicker in the history of the game, and uh, he planted the seeds. In a tight finish, both sides had the chances to kick the crucial points. Burton's with another drop kick attempt. And it's away to the right. That's three today from Mertens. The match went to extra time, with neither side yielding an inch. The scores level at 12 all. Joel Stransky went for another drop kick. I looked up, I saw it was spinning perfectly, the trajectory was good, I saw it was going on, it could never miss. I turned and went back because, you know, there was still seven minutes to go. We, we had seven minutes against an unbelievable all-black side to, to hang in there. And, of course, if you think about hanging in, you often come unstuck, and the job wasn't done yet. You know, I was so tense. I was sitting next to a Louis Late. I kept on looking at my watch. When would the referee blow the, uh, the whistle? I was so sensitive that when he eventually blew the whistle... We just found Louis Leite and myself embracing. On their first appearance in the tournament, South Africa had won the World Cup. I went down on my knee to say thank you uh, for the massive opportunity and as soon as I realised the whole team was around me um, and we just bowed our heads and said, said thanks for the opportunity to play in such an unbelievable tournament. We had 65,000 South Africans here today, tremendous support. David, we didn't have 60,000 South Africans, we had 43 million South Africans. It was always for 43 million people, we were one team that played for one country. It was just evident when we trained through South Africa and we moved through this country, how everyone was starting to embrace the Amaboko Boko, the spring box. Pina was not the only one to recognize the impact of the victory. To me, um, as much as um, the loss hurt, and, uh, hurt a lot, uh, I believed at the end of the day, rugby did a, a bigger, far bigger thing than um, uh, then put on just the World Cup. Uh, it helped unite a country. You know, one of the top businessmen here 
was telling of what happened after the match. He was going home, and next to him, there was a car full of blacks. They say to him, why are you so sad? We have won. We are at the top of the world. Those were Africans who used to boycott rugby. But that day, it changed the picture altogether. United our people.